Only recently, the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, I think, UNODC, uh -huh. uh, did a report in conjunction with Nigeria's uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh -huh. on corruption. And they found that, you know, this corruption, which you just talked about as a culture, is uh -huh. really embedded uh, in our culture. I think it was about a week or two ago when this re report was officially released uh, to the public. And they found that, you know, it, the place where corruption was most prevalent, uh, according to the rating of many Nigerians, the poll that they conducted was in the judiciary and also within the police, which boils down again to the question of institutions. How do you think institutional corruption can be addressed? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? If I had an answer for that, I, I would become a millionaire overnight. <laughs> um, but that's where we are. Um, and it goes back, for me, it's, it's basically education. And education here goes beyond just having certificates. And that's where we miss the trick. So um, I, th I heard that the German word for education is culture building. And this culture building is something that goes beyond just the schools. But you're also thinking about other institutions in society like the family, like the churches or mosques playing a role. So it's about desensitization of some of these activities. And if you look at it also, when, yeah, I mean, it was interesting you talked about that report. But as a Nigerian or as an ordinary citizen, we encounter uh, situations where we struggle to overcome some of these temptations because we are under pressure. Ordinarily, we may not want to succumb. But if you are stopped by police and um, it requires you to pay 200 naira or 500 naira to get away, why would you spend the whole day to, to fight for justice or to make sure things work? Even if you do it the first time, how often can you sustain it? So in most of the other countries where we find corruption dealt with, the institutions are enabling, they are empowering as well. So um, for us to, to fight the um, corruption the way you've mentioned or to address some of those institutional challenges, I would say we'd first of all go back to education and also building, um, we also need strong leadership uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted. And if you have leadership that is able, that is sincere, because what we have in Nigeria most of the time is that you struggle to have a leadership that is for one Nigeria, and that's where everything tends to crumble. But if you have a leadership that is able to think about one Nigeria, irrespective of where you're from, irrespective of your religion, irrespective of your gender, that you're able to um, get justice and have that sense of belonging, I think that would, would go to, uh, to a large extent go to resolving some of these issues. Well, well, some people will say that there is some attempt now. I mean, if you watch the, the news, you see um, maybe during the breaks, you see uh, some promos some campaigns you know aimed at sensitizing the people in the different forms that corruption can manifest or the everyday things that we currently do uh, which we seem to be taking for granted that corruption isn't just within government quarters that even you know as individuals we seem to be getting corrupt even in how we transact everyday business even in the marketplace uh, but some people ask first of all are those campaigns enough? Then, secondly, do they also address the underlying uh, problems? The fact that sometimes people are underpaid, people, as you rightly said, are under pressure, not just under pressure to give the bribe, but also under pressure to take the bribe. Yeah. I think it was also the issue around incentives. So um, if the incentives are not restructured, if the incentives are, are not dealt with, so it's easier for me, say, for example, to give bribe and get something out of the way. So that, that's, there is an incentive to do so. And also, when I, I can get away, easily get away with it. So it becomes a problem to do it. So I, I will go back to, so if you want to change behavior, change the incentives that go with the behavior. Prof, I'm going to let you, you know, expatiate a bit more on that mm -hmm. when we return from this break. So please hold your thoughts for us okay. in just a moment. Please stay with us. Professor Kenneth Amishi is still with us in the studio. He is the Chair in Business and Sustainable Development at the University of Edinburgh Business School. Just before we went on break, you were talking about incentives. You know, the question is how, you know, what incentives are provided. Could you shed a bit more light on that? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of incentives, are, are the benefits people get from doing, uh, engaging in certain behaviours. So if you remove the incentives, you change the behaviour. Um, so, uh, because people benefit from corruption as it is at the moment, so especially at the individual level. So, if I if I pay the bribe, the police allows me. So that's an incentive created there for people to but engage. People also ask, for instance, now we know that you know, police officers are not as well paid as they ought to be. You know, if not to provide an excuse, but then people say that if you don't address that. Could, could, can we in all good conscience say that we've not created the room for corruption? 
<clears throat> That's a very valid point as well, because I mean the incentives in that regard will also include how people are paid and rewarded. And for people who feel they, they need to make up by going the extra mile, so to speak, um, they will do so. But the question also might be also how much is enough? Um, how much, uh, we talk about the minimum wage in Nigeria most often, but some people are beginning to talk about the living wage. So probably maybe we need to go above um, the minimum wage to talk about the living wage. Uh, and that may also provide some level of uh, dignity in work for some of the people involved to the point that they'll be able to say no. So if you meet a cop in the UK, for example, that, you know, th th there is that confidence and um, uh, uh, dignity in what they do that they'll be able to stand up to you irrespective of who you are in society. Mm -hmm. And there could also be a way of rethinking um, uh, what the police is all about and even the people that go into it. So it shouldn't be a second class job. You know, if I've looked for jobs elsewhere and then the police comes up and then that's uh, one, one, one way to get employment. So it needs to be something people are passionate about. But I also recognize that in an environment like ours where unemployment is very high, it's very difficult also to, to, to know people who are genuinely interested in the different professions they enter. Mm. Just before, we, I mean, as, as we wrap up now, mm. we heard uh, Professor Yebody, I believe, mm. talking about how, uh, you know, pe the honors should now be placed on people who are accused of corruption to prove their innocence. Is that something you think will work in a country like Nigeria? Um, philosophically, I think it's a very um, uh, wrong starting point in the sense that, um, especially in, in an environment where people can come up with all thoughts, it's very easy to drag people into what they didn't do and that will be a, a dangerous way to go. I know, I mean, yes, France, it works in France because they also have different systems, different institutions. Um, we inherited the British uh, legal system which says you are innocent until proven guilty. I think it can work for us. The, it goes back to where we started from earlier on. Do people have trust in the institution and also can things be implemented? So I think uh, irrespective of the laws we have, if they are not implemented, people won't trust them and nothing will happen. Mm. Well, we have to thank you most kindly for sparing time. We do know that the conversation on the fight against corruption is an ongoing one, and we hope that we'll be able to make use of your resource as time goes on. But Professor Kenneth Amishi is the Chair in Sustainable, thank you, pardon, in Business and Sustainable Development at the University of Edinburgh Business School. Uh, that will be it for us here on Sunrise Daily from Abuja. Thank you for watching. And Maokwe Ogun is back to you. Chimbrin and Gimba in Lagos. Oh, yes, indeed. That's the program as well, even though we also thank Bamadili or Shinoa for your email. We'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain Usa. Thanks for watching. I'll see you much later on State of the Nation. I'm Gimba Umar.